A fine day, everyone. Welcome to another podcast webinar of everything ALS. And I'd like to say, seeing all of your faces every two weeks is a big high for me and for all the rest of us because we all are an extended family. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Welcome. Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you, McFinn. Welcome, everybody, um, to our uh, Wednesday Hello webinar here. series. I'm Lisa Deegan, for those who do not know me. And I've been with Everything ALS um, since the start. I lost my younger brother um, to ALS in 2018. So um, tonight, we are super excited to have Dr. Aaron Gittler from Stanford University. Tonight, he is going to be presenting on expanding mechanisms and therapeutic targets for ALS. So I just have a quick announcement before um, we begin. As most of you know, um, or maybe you don't know, one in six will be diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease. So that's, that's uh, a scary number. And biomarkers are so critical to measure disease progress and are so critical for measuring the effects of investigational drugs on people during the clinical trial process. This is super important for ALS, and we know that um, they can help improve the success rate of clinical trials that um, are only a one in nine. So we need better patient outcomes. So what we're doing, everything ALS is trying to change the face of clinical trials in ALS, and we're conducting the largest uh, bi digital biomarker voice study ever done. So we are looking for a, uh, an earlier diagnosis of ALS and a more accurate prognosis. So this is where we need your help. Uh, many of you are reaching out to us. How can we help? We want to get involved and we love that. So I can tell you exactly how you can help us. Um, join our speech study, recruit your family, your friends. Uh, we've been so successful, thanks to all of you. We've already grown it to 600 people and we want to get to our goal of 1,000. So it's been a community, inc a community effort and we thank you all. So anybody can join 18 and over. It just takes 10 minutes a week. We need healthy participants as controls and also those diagnosed with ALS or PLS with either um, limb onset or bulbar, doesn't matter. Um, anybody over 18. So ask your friends, your family. Um, it's super easy. I participate and it literally is only 10 minutes of your time. And it's really going to help change the face of clinical trials. We are already um, seeing some results that we're excited about. So um, with that, I'd like to get uh, and announce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Aaron Gittler. He is the Stanford Medicine Basic Science professor in the Department of Genetics at Stanford University with a PhD in genetics and neuroscience. In, 2000, in 2007, he established his laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania and then moved to Stanford in 2012. His research uses a combination of yeast and human genetic approaches to investigate pathogenic mechanisms of ALS. The findings from his study may translate into new targeted treatments for neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Gittler has over 153 publications and he's received numerous honors and awards. And we are so excited to have him calling in from, um, from China. It's early for him, so we so much appreciate it. So um, help me in welcoming and please join me in welcoming Dr. Um, Gittler. Thank you very much, um, Lisa, and thank you to everyone for the invitation. I'm going to uh, talk to you just a little bit about some of the uh, latest research in my laboratory so you can uh, see the efforts we're taking to study ALS and to um, learn about the causes and hopefully develop uh, therapeutic strategies. A lot of the stuff we're doing is really high tech and complicated, but it need not be. And um, so I'm going to uh, ex present some of the data just like I would um, in a, a complicated ALS meeting. But um, I, I think all of the concepts are very straightforward. And I'm really, really looking forward to discussing everything with you. 
But if there's any um, thing that's unclear or you have a question about something, please um, feel free to ask me. So my laboratory is in uh, Stanford University. I teach genetics and I have a, a research lab and we have about uh, 10 students and postdoctoral fellows. And every day we're working very hard on, uh, on studying ALS. And uh, Lisa mentioned in the introduction, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And there are, as you know, um, many types of neurodegenerative diseases that are increasing in prevalence as um, we continue to age. And these diseases include Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and of course, ALS. Mm -hmm. So, and also, as you know, these are different types of diseases. Some of them can affect memory, like Alzheimer's disease, whereas other ones like ALS is a movement disorder and cognitive ability is, is preserved. So different diseases have different um, clinical symptoms, but despite those differences in clinical symptoms, there's one theme that seems to unite all of these neurodegenerative diseases, and that's uh, protein misfolding or protein aggregation. What that means is that we all have uh, proteins in our cell that, cells that carry out functions, and these proteins, in order for them to function, they have to be uh, folded up in a proper three-dimensional structure. And somehow these uh, proteins, if they become misfolded or unfolded, they have a, a propensity to clump up together and form aggregates. And these aggregates can form outside of neurons. These are amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease, or you might have heard of neurofibrillary tangles. These are in neurons or Lewy bodies. In ALS, there's also um, um, proteins that aggregate in the brain and spinal cord. Um, and sort of the, the mission of my laboratory is to try to figure out what are the, what goes wrong in the cell when these proteins um, misfold. The approach we're taking is a little bit unusual is because we're using, at least to start, a very, very simple system to study this. We're using the baker's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The, this is the same yeast that you would make br bread or wine or beer from. It's just one little cell that um, divides into two about every two hours. It doesn't seem like the, the first model that you would, first system you would pick to study ALS. There's no brain, it's just one little cell. But this, even though it's one cell, they have all of the main pathways in the cell, all of the main machinery, and it's also very rapid. So whereas in human diseases uh, take decades to start, I'll show you some experiments where I can introduce some of these human proteins, ALS proteins, and into yeast, and in just like a couple hours, they'll start forming these clumps and causing uh, defects. And then I can start there and learn what's going on in yeast, and then go back and forth with these other other systems to try to try and um, validate some of our findings. So as I mentioned in ALS, there are uh, proteins that clump and in the uh, brain and spinal cord, about 2% of all ALS cases are caused by mutations in a gene called SOD1. And the SOD1 mutation causes the protein SOD1 to form clumps. But for the 98% of other cases, of ALS that are not caused by SOD1, they also have proteins that clump up in the spinal cord and brain, but it's not SOD1, it's another protein. And this protein is called TDP43. It's um, just a fancy name and it's a protein that binds to RNA and it normally localizes to the, um, actually this is, a, this is a better example. It normally localizes to the nucleus, this is like the, the this, uh, center of the, this is a motor neuron and this is the nucleus, uh, sort of the command center of the neuron. And TB43 is normally there, this is the normal situation and it binds to RNA and it regulates a lot of important processes in the neuron. But then this is what happens in ALS. It starts clumping up out here, outside of the nucleus. This is called the cytoplasm that can cause problems for several reasons. It can bump into the wrong proteins and wrong RNAs. And, and it also, you can see here, it's depleted from the nucleus. It's no longer here. So it's no longer able to do what it's normally supposed to do. So this could be a problem also. And in my laboratory, we're trying to study 
what it normally does and what happens when it goes wrong and goes out here and if we can reverse that. <coughs> so the first experiment that we did to try and see if we can use this very simple yeast model system to study ALS is we put TDP43 into yeast cells. This is a picture of a yeast cell. I think you can see a little daughter cell budding off of it. And then if we fused the TDP43 protein to a protein from jellyfish called green fluorescent protein, just so it glows green and we can see where it goes, we could see these little clumps of TDP43 all in the cell. And then on the right, we did something called a spotting assay. And what that means is we took our yeast cells and we serially diluted them. And then we put them onto a, an auger plate and they, they were able to form colonies and divide and grow if they just expressed that jellyfish protein, GFP. But they expressed TDP43, you can see they couldn't even grow. So TDP43 was toxic to them. So in this first set of experiments, we saw key features that are relevant, I think, to human disease, clumping up in the cell and then uh, being toxic. So even though it's a simple model system, we can uh, sort of recapitulate important features that are relevant to the disease. And then what we, we realized is, could TP43 is very tough to yeast cells, could we find other genes that could rescue them, allow the yeast cells to grow better, even in the, or worse, even in the presence of this toxic ALS protein. And this is why you would want to use like a very simple system like yeast, because you can do these genetic screens very, um, very rapidly. So we have our, um, so yeast cells have about 6,000 genes and we can manipulate all of them. We can increase their levels, we can decrease their levels. Um, there are many powerful tools. And we did what's called a genetic screen where we have our yeast cells and they're about to get um, sick from having TDP43 and we can look for genes that can let them grow better even in the face of that toxic protein. And we found some. So now we have these large plates and each of each plate has 96 spots. And each of these spots are yeast cells that express this ALS protein TDP43 and that are producing more of um, one other gene. And like this one here, this one in pink, this is a gene that allowed the cells to grow completely fine even in the face of that toxic ALS protein. So that would be, so that's exactly what we we're looking for. This is a, um, this is a gene that could uh, sort of rescue the, rescue uh, the ALS phenotypes. So um, we did this screen again and again, and we found um, the gene that were uh, one of the, we found about 40 genes that could do this. And one of them is a gene called PBP1. So um, this is why genetic screens are exciting because you don't, you don't know what hits you're gonna get until you do the screen and then it, it opens up interesting biology that you weren't expecting. So this is a wild type yeast cell. If I introduce ALS protein TB43, it kills the yeast cells. But now if I introduce this gene, actually if I, lower, if I get lower this gene, it makes the yeast cells resistant to the toxic TB43. This was specific because this, didn't, this only worked on the ALS gene. It didn't work on a Parkinson's gene called alpha synuclein, and it didn't work on a Huntington's disease gene called mutant Huntington. So it was specific to ALS. And then um, we, so this was just yeast. So we then wanted to, um, we then wanted to um, see if this could work like um, in an animal. And we first worked on the fruit fly and fruit flies are also a powerful system because it's simple, but they have a nervous system and we can manipulate them. And the first experiment we did was to introduce these genes into the eye of the fly. The eye we do because you can see it's the fly eye has this very regular crystalline structure and um, we can add genes or take them away. And if we add TDP43 to the fly eye, and this is a cross section into the eye, we see this sort of a mild weakening of degeneration of the eye. No effect at all with the taxon two, but then if we combine the two, we see this very severe phenotype, which we can rescue by lowering a taxon two. This was really cool because this meant that that sort of connection between this a taxon two gene, that's the name of the, of the human and the fly one, that uh, the yeast gene is named PVP1, but the gene we found in yeast works the same way like in an animal. 
So this, this gave us um, a, a lot of excitement that what we were finding in yeast could be relevant. And um, I, I mentioned that this gene we found as able to like combat the toxicity of the ALS protein TB43 is called ataxin 2. This gene had been identified already in another neurodegenerative disease called spinocerebellar ataxia 2 or SCA2. And this is a gene in which there is this what's called a trinucleotide repeat. That just means there are, in the gene, there are repeats of, of letters C, A, G, C, A, G. Every three letters in our genome encodes for one amino acid. So C, A, G encodes for the amino acid glutamine, and we abbreviate it for some reason Q. And it's just, this stretch is called poly Q. And normally there's 22 of these, uh, sometimes 23. But if this gets, um, expanded to greater than 34, it causes spinocerebellar ataxia 2. This is just like in hunt, the Huntington gene, but if it's in this ataxia 2 gene, it causes spinocerebellar ataxia 2. But because I found this in a screen with an ALS protein, I was wondering, could ataxia 2 also be involved in ALS? And I was just thinking, what about this middle intermediate length in between greater than normal, but not past this range for SCA2, could that cause ALS? So that was my hypothesis or my prediction. And um, what I did to test that was I collected DNA samples from about a thousand people with ALS and about a thousand healthy people. And I just measured the, the length between the two, um, uh, the length of the number of CAGs they had. And what we found was really surprising. I found 14 healthy individuals that have repeats greater than or equal to 27, but I found almost 5% of the ALS, uh, people with ALS having repeats greater than or equal to 27. So we propose that these, what we're calling intermediate length ataxin 2 repeats are a risk factor for, a genetic risk factor for ALS. What's been really exciting um, in the last, well, first of all, 5% doesn't seem like a lot, but this is actually now one of the most common genetic risk factors for ALS. So we're sort of excited about that because it, it means it all came out of using like this yeast, simple yeast system. So I think it is powerful to, to learn more about disease. And what's really exciting is it's, it's great in science when you discover something, but it's even greater when other people uh, replicate your findings and repeat it. So uh, labs around the world in the last several years have been uh, testing our hypothesis and finding, yes, it is true that having these intermediate length attacks in two repeats increases risk for ALS in Europe, in North America, in China. It really is a powerful risk factor for disease. So we've been working like crazy on trying to figure out what attacks in two is normally doing and why having these a little bit more repeats increases the risk for ALS. And then we have some evidence that having those more repeats makes the gene and the protein that it encodes more stable. And we're thinking, okay, more, more of that, more stable of that gene, increased risk for ALS. From our yeast experiment, if I got rid of the ataxin 2 gene, they were sort of protected. What if we like make ataxin 2 as a drug target? Can we, can we test that? So um, I worked with a student in my laboratory, uh, Lindsay Becker, and what she did was she first did this experiment in mouse, in which she took a mouse that um, was engineered to express this TDP43 gene and it's toxic and these mice um, develop ALS-like symptoms. And then she lowered the amount of ataxin 2 in these mice. And she found excitingly that um, this extended the survival of these mice if you lower ataxin 2 by a half, but was a really remarkable extension survival if she completely eliminated ataxin 2. She had a dramatic extension um, in survival. We then wanted to see if we can develop something more therapeutically applicable. Um, so we collaborated with a pharmaceutical company called Ionis, and they develop antisense oligonucleotides. These are DNA-like drugs that you can design them to target any gene, and they're delivered into the nervous system, and they find the gene, and then it, it, it uh, catalyzes its destruction. And um, we designed one against the ataxin 2 gene, we delivered these into those mice that were designed to get ALS-like symptoms. And this, a single administration of this into these mice had a significant extension survival um, in, these, um, in these animals. 
Um, I just want to show you a video of mice running around the cage, um, just, just to show you how uh, strong the effect can be. So these are three of these mice that we engineered to have ALS-like symptoms. And then uh, um, this is at 20 days after they were born. And we injected all three of these um, at, the, at day one. And um, two of them we injected with uh, like a placebo, like a antisense oligo that wasn't designed against anything, like a scrambled sequence. And these, uh, these uh, did not have good effects. But this one mouse, we injected with one targeting a taxin two. And this one is, it, um, is sort of able to resist those effects from a taxin two, I mean, from TDP43. So I'm really excited about a taxin two and moreover, really excited about um, antisense oligonucleotides as a therapy. They've just been approved by the FDA for the treatment of a juvenile form of motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy. They are showing very good progress uh, targeting SOD1 in clinical trials. And just like a few weeks ago, um, Ionis together with their partner Biogen started a phase one clinical trial to test uh, these ones that I just talked about in, uh, in, in humans uh, with ALS. So we're really cheering them on on the sidelines, hoping that this, this uh, therapy can work. I'm particularly excited because TDP43 clump, clumping and aggregates really is the universal feature of virtually all cases with ALS, except those with mutations in SOD1 or another gene called uh, FUS. So we hope that targeting attacks in two can, can sort of be broadly, broadly effective. And um, that's just one sort of example of what uh, the types of approaches my laboratory is studying. We have experiments in the lab to study other genes like C9, ORF72, and TBK1. Um, we're just trying to learn what TDP43 is normally doing, other ways of targeting a taxon too. So um, I, I wanted to stop early. So we have plenty of time to discuss um, anything you want to talk about um, in my lab or in ALS. And um, so, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what, what we're working on. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Gittler. That was, that was great and um, so many takeaways in that. And um, we're gonna open it up to Q&A. We're gonna have Sarah Diaz, who is on our Everything ALS team moderated. So Sarah, do you wanna take it away? And, uh, and yes, thank you. absolutely. Uh, so, like I said, Dr. Gittler, my name is Sarah, and Lisa said it too. Um, myself, along with uh, James, will be your two moderators. And if anybody has additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. So our first question um, is, what does this research mean for people currently going through ALS? How can they maybe utilize this information or can be seen to be utilizing this information in the near future? That's a very good question. And I think... Um, as, so for example, I, um, as we identify more uh, sort of, uh, genetic um, alterations that increase um, risk or may contribute to ALS, we may um, be able to um, uh, divide different um, people with ALS into different uh, treatment categories. Because I, I, uh, it's one thing that's emerging is that ALS is not a single disease. It's um, there are different causes and, and necessarily there won't be one treatment for all of them. But, and moreover, if you have a treatment, it, it'll be very hard to see it working if you don't target the right groups. So I think um, if, if now um, there's your, you can test to see the length of attacks of your repeats in a taxin two, and then that might suggest targeting a taxin two as a therapy. So I think uh, therapies, this information could help also just understanding how how the disease works and appreciating that there could be different forms of the disease that would respond to different treatments. Interesting. I'm, I'm James. I'm going to be also co-moderating as well. And the next question is, do you believe that there should be more attention given to the documented reversals by Dr. Bedlack? And if so, how can the community support these efforts? So, uh, that's not my area of, of expertise. Uh, so I, I hope you have Dr. Fedlak uh, join your group to, to present. He's a friend of mine and he's he's terrific. You know, with reversal, um, reversals are tricky because they're um, 
if if true, they're extremely rare and it's hard to know. Um, so one possibility is that someone has ALS and then it's, there's a reversal. That's pretty controversial really in the field. And it's also possible that that person had something else that mimicked ALS that wasn't a a ALS. Um, I don't know if that particularly matters, but um, but I, I think having a discussion with um, with Rick Bedlack um, would, would would be great. And he has a uh, wonderful website called ALS Untangled, which I'm sure you you, you all know about, which, which, uh, which is great. Yes, we Dr. have Bedlack met him has... on, and he will be on in the future again. We have him set up for a future date. Great. Great. Um, our next question has to do with the PolyQ repeats. Um, was there any correlation with the length of the PolyQ repeats and the age of onset in the pa patients okay. with ALS? That's a very good question. Um, we looked carefully and we did not see um, a strong correlation, but these are like very subtle repeats. It's like 20 nine versus like 22 so it's not huge so and then so we didn't really and we didn't have enough uh patients to really say it's like having 30 repeats much different than 29 is much different than 28 but um perhaps as as like uh more individuals are analyzed we'll, we'll get a sense of that um sticking on the subject of the the repeats of the poly queue uh were there any poly queue repeats uh, or were they a random event caused by mutation or were they more inherited from parents, AKA from genetics? Um, so that, that's a very good question. So far, all of our evidence suggests that these are um, inherited. There is this phenomenon called anticipation. And what that is just a genetics term. What that means is if someone has a repeat, the next generation, the repeat tends to expand a little bit and then expand a little bit, expand a little bit. So um, there, it's possible that these could sort of arise sort of spontaneously, but so far the ones we've analyzed, it seems that those are what's called in the germline or just sort of like uh, passed uh, uh, through genetics. That's really interesting. And it actually kind of ties into this next question. Is it possible if after inheriting those repeats from your parents that environmental mutations or some other environmental causation could increase the number of repeats um, thereby potentially being a um, spontaneous ALS cause. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a great question. I mean, that's what I'm very, like, it, that's a really good question. Like, that's um, what, what I'm really inter interested in investigating. So it turns out that attacks into the protein, one of, the, one of its normal sort of duties in the cell is to kind of regulate response to stress and so you can imagine that a taxin two is sitting there doing that but if it has a you know a little bit more of these cues it might like do that more aggressively or do it in an altered way and in that way like some environmental trigger might um, exacerbate things um, so yes I think that that's a really insightful point um, switching gears a little bit if the anti-sense uh, I'm probably going to butcher this so forgive me uh, oligo drugs were to be successful in humans, uh, would it be possible to use them as a preventative measure before onset of symptoms? So um, very good, very good question. So right now the clinical trials, the way they're designed is to um, test them on um, people with ALS who have that mutation. So for ALS caused by SOD1 mutations, um, the drug company comes up with some, what's called an inclusion or exclusion criteria, and then they uh, do the clinical trial. If those work, and if those get, um, if they show efficacy, then I'm certain that um, if an uh, individual has a risk factor or, gen or genetic cause for, it, for say ALS, you can imagine a situation where you would uh, start treating with that ASO uh, earlier, maybe even a lower dose, just to keep potentially mutant, pro mutant proteins from being made. This is this is just me um, me speculating on how it will go. Okay. Um, our next question talks about TDP forty three. Is it used as a ALS biomarker, or could it be used as one in the future? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a great point. Yes, so TDP43 is being used as a biomarker. So TDP43 has some modifications, little things stuck onto it, and detecting those things stuck onto it, like in uh, fluids from um, people with ALS, are, are being used um, as a biomarker. There are other, as you know, biomarkers, but that, that is one that's being developed. There's also a lot of interest in developing imaging biomarkers. So you can imagine if you could have a sort of a probe to go all through the body and find where TB3 is, and then you could be in you know, like a PET scanner and then detect that. Um, that that's, uh, people are intensely trying to develop those. Actually kind of segues perfectly into the next question. Um, it's the big one we don't usually always get. How can patients get tested and also receive therapy as well? So, um, so there is a genetic test for um, for different ALS genes, um, including a taxin two, and those uh, can be ordered through the um, ALS clinic that you're at, or uh, or together with with your physician. So the next question um, is to ask kind of more about the choice in using yeast. I know you talked in your presentation about that it repl replicates quickly, but do you know if this method is also being used in other ALS research? Um, I, so I think so. I think other, other people are also using it. Um, so we're not studying, like we're not, of course, of course, studying the disease and yeast, we're studying some early aspects of it that happen to be very relevant um, to, to disease. So, so um, I, I, I think it, it is a powerful system because we can uh, sort of focus on a key molecular and cellular events. So um, I'm aware of some other laboratories also using this approach. Okay. Uh, next question is gonna be, can ASOs be tailor-made for any mutation associated with ALS? And if so, how do they, for lack of better terminology, fix the mutation or the mutation's effects? Okay, good, good question. So, um, in theory, yes, you can you can tailor these to different mutations. Right now, um, the so for the SOD1 example, there are many different mutations in the SOD1 gene that can cause uh, can cause ALS. It's thought that all of those mutations give SOD1 some toxic properties. So the approach is to lower SOD1. In order to get, it would be hard to do a clinical trial by making ones for each mutation. So they just designed a generic antisense oligo to just target the SOD, all the SOD1 gene, including actually the good copy. Um, and that's the approach. But I can imagine in the future, once we get uh, better at designing and testing these antisense oligos, you would design ones that are more specific or tailored. Um, several ALS genes, it's thought that they're causing the disease by giving some toxic function. So then you'd want to just go in and lower that toxic gene. That's one way. There, <coughs> there are other strategies you can imagine where you might want to um, increase expression of like a gene that was decreased that was causing the disease. And there are ways of doing that um, with ASOs as well. There's this other technology that's emerging called CRISPR in which you can kind of, and there's variations of it, sort of go in with like molecular scissors and like, I and actually like find and replace even now, like you would on your keyboard, you can like find this and change it. And uh, um, so those techniques and technologies are, are emerging. Wonderful. Um, this next question is a bit technical, so you may have to do some explaining before you answer it, but, um, is there research on ASOs which target downstream defective autophagic mechanisms instead of being specific to an upstream mutation like a TDP43? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, so autophagic mechanisms. Uh, so that, that just is a fancy way of, so the cell has sort of like a garbage disposal where things that are messed up, the cell like binds and like, uh, Autophagy is just like a, it means self eating. So it just like eats off those bad proteins and, and like destroys them. So um, that could be one sort of generic way of dealing with these misfolded proteins. So um, yes, there are, there's certainly research involved. I'm not aware of antisense oligo approaches, but there are other researches 
research using small molecules to boost sort of the flux through this pathway and stuff like that um, to look downstream. Okay. Next question I thought was kind of an interesting one in regards to the polyq repeats. Would the number of Q repetitions themselves indicate different ALS types? That that's a good point. Um, we don't have evidence for that, but I think it's just because we don't uh, sort of we haven't sort of stepped back and tried to look in that lens. Lens uh, that that could be interesting, actually. It's hard with genetics; you really need large numbers to kind of see, have patterns emerge. Well, that just led to an opening of potentially being able to start a study ourselves <laughs> for uh, providing such genetic data. So, you know, that that leads to some opportunities. Um, our next question is, is there a way to check through either blood work or other means whether somebody has a buildup of ataxin 2? Um, that's a good point. There are researchers I know who are developing sort of methods to sensitively detect levels of ataxin 2. Um, I'm not sure of the status of those uh, experiments. Next question is more of a broad question, um, but your opinion nonetheless would be uh, appreciated. What is the current theory for those that do not have any of the known genes for ALS, but still have ALS? I believe it's referencing um, familial versus sporadic. Yeah, that's that's a really good good question, and that's that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm really excited about the taxin too is because sporadic in sporadic ALS, um, they uh, that is associated with clumping of TDP43, just like in familial ALS, sporadic ALS is the same thing. So we think the taxin two gene should be very relevant even for sporadic ALS, not just um, familial forms. We think the familial forms are useful because they tell you what sort of they give you genes which focus on pathways but those pathways are, are very relevant to sporadic disease so indeed the the clinical trial that biogen has just started for a, targeting attacks in two with an anti-sense oligonucleotide or aso is on uh, sporadic als okay that's really interesting i'm i'm, I'm very interested in the sporadic als side so I, that it definitely brings in another perspective um, this next question, unless anybody else has additional questions to add into the chat, is our last one that we have um, either has been in the chat already or pre-written down. So I'm giving the people the opportunity because we have just some more time. So, oh, and somebody already jumped on it. So we'll just grab that already. Is it possible that atypical protein molecules be generated through the neoglucogenesis process? And could you explain what that means before you answer the question? <laughs> Sure. So um, there are pa pathways in a cell that can like, uh, sort of um, produce uh, produce nutrients, um, and um, this is sort of like a normal part of metabolism. But um, I, it's an interesting qu question. Um, but it. I, I'm not aware of any evidence that sort of strange proteins are made during during that process. Okay. All right. But uh, but that's not to say metabolism is not important for, for the disease, which, which I really think it is. Um, just to kind of branch on that one, oh, we got another one. Uh, what type of amyloidosis is one? Oh, wild. Sorry, that's just a comment. That was a question. Um, the last question will be then, given that the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines are based on RNA technology, can this technology be used in potential treatments for ALS? Um, I, so um, sort of, I guess, broadly, yes. So it's the same idea. It's the same general idea of, um, your, of the antisense oligos. You're delivering some nucleic acid with some modifications. So that's that's the same. That's the uh, same idea. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gittler, for coming and joining us. This has been very informative. And I, I think that everyone has, this is the first time we've gotten through all of our questions. So I'm even more excited to say that everybody got their stuff answered. So we thank you so much for your time. 
Um, this will now be the portion of our period where we will go to an open forum where everyone can unmute themselves and discuss what we um, talked about, as well as uh, see how everyone's doing and check in with McFinn. But we want to first and foremost, thank you again for your time and especially getting up early. Um, I know it's 7 a.m. there and, and we do appreciate you uh, spending your afternoon or your morning and our afternoon with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care.